You want to know something that I've come across so often by now in fiction that it just makes me want to put my head right through a brick wall because it's so frustrating. I mean, I'm not even that good of an economist, and yet even I know that there is no possible way that a medieval kingdom would have five million gold pieces just lying around. No! <laughs> ah! Why is it that so many writers just cannot even bother comprehending the slightest bit of what makes an economy, how an economy functions, what actually goes into making money work? Seriously, it doesn't take that long to do the research to figure it out, and it does wonders for your story in making it feel real. Hi there, everyone. Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And before I go on with the rest of my rant, let me remind you that this is the beginning of the month of October. <laughs> if you missed my introductory video to the Choose Your Own Horror Adventure Story, then I highly encourage that you pop on over to our community posts and have a look at what we're doing right there. You can be a part of a Choose Your Own Horror Adventure Story that we are going to be doing throughout this month. And seriously, we need you to make it work out. So please pop on over there. Get involved in the story that is happening. It is going to be great. Now then, back to the rant. For those of you who have been around on this channel for a little while, it should come as no surprise to you that I have a lot of axes to grind with George R. Martin. There's some things that he does really well and a lot of things that he does stupidly. And so it always confounds me when people are like, wow, he's just this absolutely brilliant writer. Everything he does is perfection. And I'm like, have you not looked at just the few passages where he tries to be creative with money and comes across as someone who has no idea the actual value of dollars or of collateral? But this isn't just a George R. Martin problem. This is prevalent throughout fiction. It is especially egregious if you've read manga or manhwa where characters are just throwing around billions of coins and billions of dollars and billions of whatever ridiculous fantasy kind of currency they have. And it just, it makes, it just devalues everything. And anyone who's, been, who's played D&D &D where they've gone on all of these quests, they've done all these things, and they've accumulated all of this cash, and they haven't gone shopping, and then realize that they can buy themselves a castle, and then it feels like, oh sweet, we can buy a castle. And we're level 9. It, it makes everything just feel ridiculous. And that's one of the problems with incorporating economics into any kind of story. Economics act according to a very solid series of laws and rules. Me personally, I say that some of them aren't quite concrete. There's definitely some black magic happening in the stock exchange. But that aside... <laughs> Economics makes sense if you understand the rules. You don't have to be a great economist to understand the value of cash, the value of an item, the laws of supply and demand, and how that can be manipulated. Very simple stuff. You don't have to be like Spice and, Spice and Wolf, which is a phenomenal fictional story that uses all kinds of economic ideals and economic scenarios to help further along a fantasy rom-com. That is actually really great storytelling, but so few, so many stories fall short of that. So few stories actually manage to reach those same levels of economic understanding. And while I know that a lot of people love to rag on some of the simplicity within Brandon Sanderson novels, he does get economics down really well. Maybe not so much on a micro level, but definitely on a macro level when he talks about the use of boxings and what actually, for instance, funds or I should say, rather, backs the currency that people have. Like back when America and so many other nations used the gold standard. If you wanted to tank another country's economy, you went after their gold reserves. You somehow found some way of either devaluing their gold or stealing their gold in order to destroy their currency, which would then mean that they can't trade as well anymore and then it would obliterate their economy. 
Now then, not all fantasy, fictional, sci-fi stories actually need to go that particular route. And you can arbitrarily just throw out there, oh, a character dropped 20 gold coins and bought something. A character used so many imperial credits to buy something. That is absolutely fine. And while I could definitely go on a little mini rant about how George Lucas does not understand money in the prequel trilogy at all, I mean, why doesn't Qui-Gon Jinn just use 20,000 Imperial credits to go buy himself another ship? Because Watto basically says that he could do that with those 20,000 credits. <laughs> that all aside, the plot of Phantom Menace aside... For the most part, it just makes sense. Money is exchanged for goods. Oh, one character doesn't like the money that's being used. You need to have hard cash, so you go gambling in order to get hard cash. Okay then, boom, story can move on. The problem is, is that when you decide to make economics really a part of your story, where it becomes something very critical either to a character or to the plot and you don't understand what is going on. So like for instance in the Game of Thrones series the fact that the Lannisters lent five million gold crowns to the crown in order to help them fund various tournaments and projects that would completely devalue the worth of gold. What you begin to realize as you are reading through the Game of Thrones series is that, these, is that this world is so depraved that people are willing to commit mass murder or kill heroes or villains for literally pennies. The gold is worthless, and as such, the Lannisters should not have any power because their power largely comes from the gold that they have with which they were able to accumulate all forms of loyalty. Without that gold, the Lannisters lose so much. That is a point throughout the entire series. But when you pump so much gold into the economy, the gold becomes worthless and people would turn to other things like silver or copper in order to back the currency of the realm. And because in many other places you have an abundance of such things, such as copper, that's why copper is not used, but gold would be used because it is such a precious metal. So, so Westeros isn't just suffering from a debt problem, it is suffering from a massive inflation problem. Something which George R. R. Martin just completely forgets right there, but continues to come back to the economics, the economics, the economics, and it just doesn't make any sense! Ugh. And then, as I brought up earlier, with anime, with manga, with manhwa, it is absolutely ridiculous when a character is all like, what's going to be my salary if I do this one job? Oh, go kill the ogre? Here is 500,000 gold coins! Really? Ogres better be like a god-level threat in this world for 500,000 gold coins. And how the heck does a simple guild hall in a city that isn't even the capital have that much cash on hand to give to the hero when he or she comes back after using their OP powers to kill one ogre? Or the ridiculousness where characters go and mine and harvest all different kinds of little tiny uh, goblins and wolves and whatnot and collect their magical cores and their skins and their bows and whatever and they bring it on back and then the guild master's like oh, this is such fine quality this is at least a million whatever you better be reckoning this according to stuff such as yen where it's all like hey a thousand yen but even then if you've been to Japan or if you've lived in Japan, you realize that you can actually buy quite a bit for a thousand yen, which if you just want to know kind of the conversion right now, that's like seven dollars. So you mean so like and even then it just gets ridiculous for oh you killed this ogre, here's five hundred thousand. Okay, well let's divide it by seven. It's still a ridiculous number of gold coins that a guild would not have and that is completely disproportional to the task that characters have gone for and on top of that it's too much cash inflation must be running rampant in these isekai fantasies Ugh. now you might be wondering okay Lars you've already ranted for nearly 10 minutes now about this why does it matter this is fantasy you can throw out whatever number you want, and so long as people believe it, we'll go along with it. Well, for one thing, the suspension of disbelief. If the, the amount of cash or the usage of cash is just so ridiculous, it does take people out of the experience. 
And again, you have a great example like Spice and Wolf, where they clearly explain the worth of coins. You know how much you can get with silver coins. You know how much you can buy with gold coins. And there's some really great conversations about what can be done with product. For instance, you've got Lawrence being like, I don't need coin. If I have product, I have collateral, which can be turned into cash which is something that then Holo is like, oh, oh, that makes sense. And he's like, yeah, and if I have the right kind of goods, I don't even need tons of goods. I just need to have the right kinds of goods, and I can then deliver them to someone that I know in a, within a proper amount of time, so that way I get what is worth for both my time and for the product that I am carrying. But another great example of this actually comes from the Beyonders trilogy. There are some moments in the first book that do a wonderful job of making sense of the ridiculous coinage system within Beyonders. They're not using coins, they're using beads. They've got little copper beads, little silver beads, these little gold beads. Beads, beads, beads. <laughs> I can't think of anything actually worse to use for money than beads because if you drop it, it's just going to scatter everywhere in the worst possible way. Why these people decide to use beads, I don't really know. And yet it actually makes total sense. You learn really quickly how much you can buy for one silver bead. One silver bead basically is the equivalent of splurging at a high-end restaurant. You then realize, oh, if you want to dress like a noble from the top, from the top on uh, down, you need to have 10 gold beads, 10 gold druma. If you want to convince someone that you're a royalty, you throw at them a 100 gold druma and just say, buy me whatever, which is a lot of money. It's very quickly established that people rarely walk around with even a silver bead, a silver druma. Most people are walking around with tons of copper druma, which is a lower denomination of this bead, of this coin. And so it's one of the things that then separates some of the big players, and it's one of the things that the heroes have to quickly get a grasp on when they are thrown into this world where they have to pretend to be nobles, and they have got all this cash, and if sure, they kind of have an out by just throwing it away at people and be like, ha, ah, I'm noble, I'm noble. But then you realize also really fast, just how, you realize really fast just how quickly cash can run out if you're not careful and how much danger that cash can get you into in a cutthroat society. And so in a, in a really funny way, Beyonders, which is aimed at at mid-teens and pre-teens for the audience actually does economics better and the usage of coin than the gritty, realistic Game of Thrones. But let's move away from fantasy and even go on over to sci-fi. One of the things I like about the Star Trek series, and this is not just OC or or uh, looking at uh, the, new gen the next generation, I'm talking about really all across Star Trek. What you learn really fast is that the Federation is well beyond the need for money. They have enough for what they need to do. The rest is basically all based on your merit, on what you contribute to society. Society works together in order to make things function. This is in contrast to the crazy race, the Ferengi. And the Ferengi really don't make any sense if you try to take them at face value when it comes to economics. True, they have some rules, the rules of acquisition, which actually do make a lot of sense. And what they then do is they then take sometimes really ridiculous things like latinum plated with gold or this hypno device that will be used to destroy Captain Picard. Well, I have no idea really what any of this stuff is worth, but the Ferengi sell it by showing what they are willing to do or to give up in order to have these things. So like for instance, the one Ferengi who wants to destroy Captain Picard is willing to sacrifice not only his entire fortune, but his honor as a tradesman, as a Ferengi, in order to have the shot at revenge. That tells you how much revenge to this one character is worth and how much the item he is using is also worth. So even though you don't understand what the heck the currency is within the Star Trek universe, you understand that this is a lot. Or when you've got various Frangi trying to get their hands on latinum or on platinum or whatever, or worthless gold, you understand, you understand their glee or their horror about what they are doing based on what they are willing to give 
up. And this is kind of denoting a barter system. And it's totally fine to use a barter system within your fiction. To be like, okay then, well you know what, there's this really nice backpack that holds, for whatever magical reason, ten times the amount of any other backpack. What is this worth? I have a hen right here that, lo that lays silver eggs, and they're edible too. Whoa. I would love to give you this backpack for that hen. Yes, but these are silver. This is a silver egg laying hen. And those eggs, remember, you can eat. Maybe I want a little bit more than just a magical backpack. And so then you've got a conversation going there about worth. And you don't then have to worry about, well, how much gold backs the currency? Or are Druma worth it? Or how much light must be poured into the spheres in the Stormlight Archive in order to make them tempting? Even though we already know that it actually doesn't matter if a sphere is lit or dune, they still are worth the same depending on what gem is hidden in the little bead of glass. And yes, I know I'm throwing a lot of things on out there. There's a lot of stories that use economics and use them well. It's just really, really frustrating to find so many stories that don't use economics really well. And if you as a writer aren't, aren't confident in your economic prowess, then you don't have to necessarily worry about getting really deep into the economics of your world. You can just show characters saying, I pay for this. I have a budget. I have a paycheck that doesn't cover all of my expenses. Simple little conversations like that already kind of give you an idea that this world is lived in, that people have money, and people will use their own lived-in experience, transpose it upon the characters, and you don't have to worry about carrying that weight unless you want to. And if you do want to do that, you need to understand how economics works. Whew. So, <laughs> that right there, that is my rant. Economics can be difficult. I've already admitted I am not a really great economist. There's a lot of things that go over my head. A lot of things that need to be explained to me twice when it comes to money in the world of the economy and big business. However, I do know enough to realize when a story has gone completely ridiculous and does not make any sense because it completely snaps me out of my immersion and makes me question how this world actually functions and then to come to realize that it actually doesn't function at all and that the author is just forcing this bit of world building to work in order to make a certain point in the plot function. And that's like trying to fit a, a round peg into a square hole. It just, it does not work. So understand your economics, understand if economics should even be a part of your story. And if it's not a big deal, don't worry about it. Have like one or two little lines again about, I don't get paid enough for this, or don't worry, I'll cover that. Boom, 20 bucks for whatever. People will be like, okay, that's how much it's worth, and they'll move on with their day, and they will not question what you're doing with your story. Instead, they'll focus on the big things, which is the plot and the characters. So that's my writing advice. That's my rant. Thank you for watching up until this point. If you're looking for more writing advice, please check out our other videos here on our channel, or you can also head on over to our podcast, Camille's Harem. And remember, we are doing the Choose Your Own Horror Adventure story that we would love for you to be a part of. If you want to be a part of it, then head on over to our community tab and participate in the polls and the posts that will be there. They'll be happening throughout the month of October, leading us to a grand spooky conclusion that you will be in charge of. Make sure you read the rules. We're ready to have you jump aboard that particular adventure. And thank you for watching, and until the next video, y'all, tschüss.